Good evening, everyone. I hope this is working. <laughs> it's been a while since I've done the uh, singing and everything on the computer, and um, I, when I did it earlier, I don't think those were the same songs that I played, so I don't know exactly what happened there. But um, we're glad that uh, you're here with us and that we have this opportunity to study together from the Word of God, and uh, that's what we're going to going to try to do. Hopefully everything is okay and going smoothly. I'm trying to watch on YouTube and Facebook and make sure that everybody uh, can see and there are no problems and it looks okay so far. Uh, but uh, anyway, glad that we're able to do this and uh, to be able to study together. And uh, we're going to study about the book, uh, The Song of Solomon tonight. Before we do that, we're going to read a couple of verses from 1 Kings chapter 3 and chapter 4 and um, let that kind of lead us into our study. Um, but before we do that, let's have a word of prayer, and then we will uh, get into our Bible study. Our most holy and righteous Father in heaven, we're so thankful to you for this day of life and the many blessings of it. We're thankful that we have the opportunity to come together and to join our hearts in studying together from thy word and singing these songs of praise to thy name and giving our prayers up before thy throne of grace and mercy. Um, we're thankful that even when we can't be together physically, we can still join together uh, by the means of computers and uh, all these things that we have. We pray that we'll always uh, use those opportunities to, to thy honor and glory. We're thankful for thy word that thou hast given us and the truth that it teaches us. And pray that as we study together, we'll open our hearts to it and that we'll take the things that we learn and uh, seek uh, ways to use them out in our daily life. Most of all, we're thankful for Christ, for the hope that we have in him, for your great love for us that allowed you to give your son as a sacrifice for our sins, for his willingness to come and to die upon the cross that we might have forgiveness. We pray for forgiveness and pray that when we stumble and fall short that we'll always seek to come back to thee and to be obedient to thy will and to find the forgiveness that we have through the blood of thy son. We're thankful for this congregation of thy people and pray that you'll bless us as we study together this evening and that we'll be uh, diligent and determined to live lives that will bring honor and glory to thy name. Again, we're so thankful for Christ and all the blessings that we have in him, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So um, we're going to talk about the Song of Solomon, and I had intended to do a couple more lessons about uh, Solomon as, as king to kind of lay a foundation before we actually talked about the Song of Solomon, but since today is Valentine's Day, I figured it would uh, be good to go ahead and to talk about this book on this day because it, it's a love story. It's the story of Solomon and apparently his first wife and their courtship and their marriage and their honeymoon and troubles in their marriage and they reconcile and, and it's really just, just a love story. And so what better day than Valentine's Day to talk about that, I guess. And I also got to thinking today, it's probably best uh, that we study this book while we're not in the same room with one another uh, because it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a mushy kind of book. You know, it's very romantic and very poetic and um, very clear in talking about the love between a husband and wife and a man and a woman. And so uh, it's an important book. It's part of the Bible for a reason. And sadly, it is often not just neglected, but uh, even when it's read, it's misunderstood, and people uh, put this kind of spin on it and this interpretation to it that, you know, God didn't intend to try to make it teach something that it really wasn't talking about because, for some reason, some people don't want there to be a book about love and the relationship, the physical relationship between a husband and wife. But that's part of God's plan for man and for marriage, and um, it's nothing to be ashamed of. And this book, of course, uh, is going to deal with that. Uh, we're not going to be able to read the whole thing, of course. We're just going to kind of pick out some verses from uh, each chapter and, and kind of get an overview of the book and to get the, you know, the, the meaning of it. And certainly... Uh, encourage all of us to read it on our own so we can see everything that is uh, said and talked about in that book. But I wanted to start in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 12 just to remind us of a couple things about Solomon that we haven't talked about yet, but they're things that we kind of know. Uh, in chapter 3 and verse 12, God says to Solomon, Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart. 
so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. So God asked Solomon what he wanted. Uh, if he could ask for anything, what would he ask for? Solomon asked for wisdom, and God blessed him with that wisdom, uh, greatest wisdom you know, that had been uh, on the earth. So because of that wisdom, Solomon was able to do you know, tremendous things for the nation of Israel to lead them as a king in, in so many good ways. And because of that, the nation of Israel would experience its greatest period of growth and of peace and of prosperity. So everything that David had fought so hard for, Solomon kind of reaps the benefits of it. And because he asks for wisdom and God gives him that wisdom, he then is able to build on what David had done. And so this is really the, the zenith, the pinnacle of the nation of Israel, the, the height of their existence. Um, and, and after this, it's going to be you know, downhill for, for the most part. So in chapter 4 in verse 20, the Bible describes this. We're gonna, not going to read this whole passage, but it says Judah and Israel were many as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. And so it describes the nation. They had grown into a mighty nation, and it was a time of prosperity. And it goes on to talk about just how wealthy Solomon was and all the wonderful things that God had uh, blessed them with. When you look at verse 25, it says, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. So it was a time of peace. They were in safety. Uh, every man under his vine and his fig tree is a picture of, of leisure, of resting uh, of, under trees that are you know, producing fruit. So there's prosperity. There's the ability to be at peace and to be at leisure because of that. And so Solomon was able to bring this into being through this wisdom that God uh, granted him. And so during this time of peace and prosperity, Solomon had time to do many things, and one of those was to write. And so when you look in chapter uh, 4 and verse 32, it says that he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. And he goes on to talk about some of the things that, that he wrote about and that he talked about. So Solomon wrote Proverbs, obviously most of the book of Proverbs, uh, and he also wrote songs, a thousand and five songs. Now out of those songs, the greatest of all of them is the Song of Solomon. And we know that because the first verse of the Song of Solomon is the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. When it says the Song of Songs, it means this is the greatest of all the songs that came from Solomon. So it's the greatest of his songs. In fact, it's the only one of his songs that we still have today that are available to us, you know, that we can read. But that's kind of the background of this book. So it's beautiful in its poetry and its description of, of love. And God says that it is important and it's significant and it has a place in scripture for us to study and to learn about. So let's turn to the book of the Song of Solomon and talk about just a little bit of the uh, background information concerning it and then we'll kind of quickly go through an outline of, of the book and, and go through the text and notice some lessons that we can learn. So the author of the book is obviously Solomon, never really disputed until you know modernists who try to argue about everything about the Bible. They try to, you know, make it later and all these other things, but it's Solomon's writing. It's very similar in style to many of the things he wrote in Proverbs, and, uh, and so we know that it's, uh, that it's Solomon's, and then the Bible says that it is. The title is, from verse 1, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. So the Hebrew Old Testament called it the Song of Songs, which is the first part of, of that verse. Um, when that was translated into Latin in the Vulgate, 
Um, the Latin for that was canticum canticorum. And so because of that, sometimes this book is called Canticles. So you may hear that, or when reading a commentary, you may see the word Canticles. It comes from the Latin, from the Hebrew. That means the Song of Songs. Most English versions from the King James Version onward call it the Song of Solomon, which is kind of a contraction of verse 1, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Instead of saying all of that, they just said the Song of Solomon. So that's usually what we call it and what we think of it as, the Song of Solomon. He wrote it. It is in the form of a song or at least poetry, and so it's the Song of Solomon, the greatest of his songs, and it's the only one that we have uh, recorded for us. So when was this written? The date generally given is, you know, around 980 to 970 B.C., um, but it's in the early days of Solomon's reign. Uh, and we know that there are many hints and ideas in the text as to why it has to be early when Solomon was king. Uh, one of the things is that the places that are mentioned are all over the land of Israel, north to south, and it's uh, as though they're all one nation. So it was written in the United Kingdom before they divided into Israel and, and Judah. So it has to at least have been that early. But it has to have been early in Solomon's reign because the story that is described here um, is the story of a young man and a young woman um, falling in love with each other and uh, getting married. Uh, and it's not the story of a man who's about to get married to, you know, wife number 642. You know, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines by the time it was all over. This is not a love story about, you know, your 600th wife. This, this is the story about that first time that you fall in love. Okay, so it had to be early um, in his reign. The first wife that we're told about in the, the history part of the Bible, in Kings and Chronicles, the first wife of Solomon was the daughter of uh, Pharaoh, obviously an Egyptian, and it was a political arrangement. Uh, but that's not who Solomon is marrying in the Song of Solomon. Uh, this is a, a woman, a maiden, from uh, around Lebanon, the northern part of, of Israel. So this would likely have been his first wife uh, before he fell away and, you know, married so many women and, and so many other things that he fell away on. Uh, but this is very early in, uh, in his life and in his reign. Uh, and there's, of course, a purity and a beauty uh, to that that we'll see as, as we go through. There are basically three characters in the book. There's Solomon, who is the bridegroom, uh, who would be the husband. There is the maiden of Lebanon, who becomes his wife, so she's the bride. And then there's a chorus of women who, from time to time, speak up and they'll praise uh, the, the, the woman in the story, the new queen, uh, in different ways. But it's basically just Solomon and this lady that he is courting and then marries, and it's their relating to one another. It's basically the story of this, of this book. So the theme of the book is clearly uh, about love. When you think about Song of Solomon in the context of the wisdom literature, those five books of wisdom, the book of Job addresses suffering why do men suffer? Where does our suffering come from? Is it because of our sins or, you know, what, why does it happen and how do you deal with suffering? So one of the big problems that we all face and deal with in life is suffering. Job deals with that. The Psalms focus on worship, which includes, you know, everything from gratitude and thanksgiving to God, uh, forgiveness of sin, and just all the different things that we've seen in relation to uh, worship. Psalms covers that aspect of man. The book of Proverbs, of course, deals with wisdom. What is true wisdom? The difference between the wisdom of men and the wisdom that comes from God. 
and what does it look like when you live according to God's wisdom. Proverbs shows us that. Ecclesiastes um, is about what's the meaning of life? What is the purpose? Why am I here? Um, and it's in, in, in the sense of life is vanity and vexation of spirit without God. If you just live according to man's wisdom, which Proverbs was trying to teach us not to, if you reject God's wisdom and you live according to man's wisdom, then life is meaningless. It has no meaning. But with God, it does have meaning. And so it deals with that, you know, fundamental existential question of what, what is life all about? What's the purpose? And Song of Solomon then, of course, deals with love. And it has to do with, uh, with, with true love. This book shows the nature of, of true love, what it looks like, how it differs from things that we often call love. It shows the power of true love. And really what it does is to, to show us to take Ecclesiastes and to say life is meaningless. Song of Solomon says it's not if you have love. Love gives meaning to life. And it's kind of encapsulated in the love of a man for a woman and they become husband and wife and that gives life meaning but in the bigger picture and the broader sense it's about true love that can only be uh, manifested from God and comes from him and in fact this book ends with talking about love as the very flame of Jehovah so it comes from him and it gives life meaning so these books of wisdom, you know, they really take the big questions and, and the big things that we face as, as people and address them from God's perspective and give real answers. And sometimes because it's poetry, you know, in, in poetic writing, we tend to look down upon these as lesser books and focus more on, you know, different parts of the Bible, but uh, they're not lesser in, in any way, uh, they're very necessary and essential for us to, to read and understand. So the style of this book is poetic. Um, it's not an allegory. It's not written as a parable or as a type. Um, most often, maybe not most often, but a lot of the time, older commentators, uh, you know, back even before the Reformation movement, would try to make this story an allegory of God's love for man. And there are things that we can learn about God's love for man from the Song of Solomon, but that's not what it's about. It's not an allegory of that. From the time of the Reformation onward, most commentators say that it's a picture of Christ's love for the church. And there are some things that we can learn about the love that Jesus has for the church, which is his bride, in principle from this book, but the Song of Solomon is not about Jesus' love for the church. It's not an allegory. It's, it's just a story in poetic form about a man who loved a woman and how they loved each other and they were married and they went on their honeymoon and they had ups and downs in their marriage and, and they stuck through it all. And that, that's what the story is. So it's not, there's no allegory here. There's no, um, some try to say that it's a drama, that this was a play and people would act it out. And there's no evidence of that either. Uh, modernists say it's just a collection of random poems about love that somebody, you know, stuck together. But that doesn't fit either. There's a clear narrative and story and theme through, uh, through the whole book. So it's basically a poetic form of a story about love, about Solomon and his love for his first wife. So a brief outline of the book, chapter 1, uh, verse 1 through chapter 3 and verse 5 is the courtship. Chapter 3 and verse 6 through chapter 5 and verse 1 is the, the marriage and the honeymoon. 
And then chapter 5, verse 2 through the end, chapter 8 and verse 14, is there's a difficulty that arises in the marriage. There's a resolution to the problem. And in the end, their love is stronger than it was before. And that reveals to us things about the, the nature of, of true love. So that's basically how the, the, how the book breaks down and ultimately what its purpose and what its message is. So let's read some of these verses in Song of Solomon and talk about um, some lessons that we can learn from it. And as I said, we're not going to read the the whole thing. You know, it's eight chapters, uh, so it's not a very long book, but we just won't have time to uh, read it all. And some of it is uh, kind of embarrassing to read, you know, in mixed company uh, because of the descriptions, you know, of the beauty of the woman and of the man as well. Um, I mean, it's beautiful. It's nothing vulgar, but it's... um, you know, it's a young man and woman in love, and it's written just that way. So let's talk about the first part, chapter 1 through the beginning of chapter 3, uh, the courtship of this, of this young couple. So verse 1 says, the song of songs, which is Solomon's, and then we get right to it. It says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. And so we can see immediately what this book is about. These are two people who love one another. Now, the first part of this section, in fact, most of what's in chapter 1 through the first part of chapter 3 is the, the maiden, the woman, talking about her love for Solomon. So she has several things um, to say there, and there are a couple places where he replies. But I want to focus in on verses 5 and 6 because uh, this is where it kind of begins to show us the difference between, you know, infatuation or uh, attraction or even lust and true love. So in verse 5, she says, I am black but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me, They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. We learn something important here about true love. And the first thing is that that true love is not based on physical appearance. This young lady says that she is black but comely. And comely means that she's just plain. There's nothing, you know, amazing about her that she would think. She doesn't see that she's beautiful or why Solomon would give her a second glance while he would focus his attention upon her. She sees herself just as, you know, plain, average, normal, every day. Uh, And that's the idea of the word comely there. So Solomon's love for her is not just based on her appearance. Now, to him, she's absolutely beautiful, and he's going to describe her, every bit of her, in bizarre descriptions. I have a preacher friend on Facebook who's been, uh, on Valentine's Day, he's been posting these pictures of, um, like a Valentine card, and it has Solomon's head on there, and he'll quote one of these verses uh, from Song of Solomon and, you know, say this is to his wife. And it's, um, <laughs> it's bizarre to read, you know, that y- your eyes are like dove's eyes and, you know, whatever, all these different things that you read in here. To us, it doesn't sound very appealing or very attractive, and they're funny to read. Uh, but when you look at it in the poetic sense, you understand that he was being very complimentary of her and she of him, um, as well and apparently it worked because they got married and Solomon must have known what he was doing I mean he had a, hun- a thousand women you know, at the end so maybe he knew what he's talking about uh, but it doesn't seem that romantic to us maybe but it's it's that poetic style she talks about being black and she explains in verse 6 that it's because the sun hath looked upon me and the idea there is that she was outdoors working in the sun and so her skin was not protected and she was dark tanned uh, of of dark skin and so it made her appear uh, black and you know 
in our day and time, people go to, to tanning beds because we can't get enough sun, time in the sun. Uh, and we see being tan as, you know, the ideal, or at least some people do. But in these days, if you were tan, it meant that you had to work outside. And so you were, you know, like lower class. The wealthy could hire servants to work outside for them, and they stayed inside, and their skin, you know, didn't become tanned by the sun. So she is describing here that she was a servant, and, and not like a hired servant, but that she served other people. She says, my mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards. So this tells us something else about true love, that what attracted Solomon to her wasn't just her physical appearance, but it was the kind of person that she was, that she'd shown herself to be a servant. She was willing to serve others, her mother's children, so her sisters or her brothers. She would work and help in their vineyards, and she says at the end of that verse, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. So she hadn't taken as good care of herself, maybe as, as she should have, because she was too focused on serving others. So true love, it's not just about physical appearance, but it's about inward character. And she'd shown herself to be a servant and someone who was willing to sacrifice because of her love and her care and her concern for others. And that is a much stronger foundation to build a relationship on, to build a marriage on, than, than how a person looks physically. Because physical attraction, you know, fades, looks can change, and they do, obviously, with time. It has to be built on something more than just she's good looking or he's good looking. And that's what we're being shown here, that true love has a much deeper foundation than just outward appearance. So true love manifests itself in serving others, and it demonstrates itself by being willing to sacrifice for others. Now, obviously, we can make application of that to God's love for us, that he loved us so much, Christ came to this world to be a servant, a servant who sacrificed himself for us simply because he loved us. And it's the perfect demonstration of true love. And we get a glimpse of it here. But let's go down further into, uh, we'll skip down into chapter 2 and, and verse number 1. So she's still uh, talking and she says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. So you have a statement here where in verse 1 she says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. And he replies to her as uh, the lily among thorns. So is my love among the daughters. So we learned an important lesson about, about love here also, that true love um, creates a devotion to another because it sees what others cannot see. So I'm going to ruin a lot of our songs here when we talk about this verse. Uh, you know, we sing about Jesus as the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon and all those things. And it's kind of taken on this, this symbolic meaning about the beauty of Jesus and the purity of Christ and, and those things. But when she says here, I am the rose of Sharon, it literally says, I am a rose of Sharon and a lily of the valleys. And she's saying, if you look out in this valley, there are thousands of these flowers that are just common ordinary, everyday flowers. We might even think of them as, you know, weeds that grow and flower. And she says, I'm just one of those, one among hundreds, one among thousands. She's not saying I'm something special. I am the Rose of Sharon. I'm just a Rose of Sharon. I'm just a lily of the valley. I'm nothing special. So we, we have all these, you know, songs about Jesus as the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon, and we kind of miss what's actually being said here. Solomon's reply to her is, you're not just a lily of the valley. He says, you're like a lily among thorns. And the word there is the word for brambles. So, you, you know, you think of those dead, 
desiccated plants and they're not there's no beauty to look at and in the midst there's this one flower he says that's who you are to me she may have seen herself as just a common ordinary flower that didn't stand out from the crowd but to Solomon she was the only rose the only flower you know on, on the whole planet he said everything else is thorns and, and briars and brambles to me you are the only flower so he could see the beauty in her that she couldn't see in herself or didn't want to you know admit to herself and so that's what true love does it sees what others cannot and so he could again he obviously thought she was beautiful but he also looked at her character and the kind of person that she was and how she demonstrated that in how she served and how she sacrificed with her family and all of those things and so he could see just how truly beautiful she was and to him she's the only flower that existed and she's going to return that to him he's the only one for her as well and so that's what true love does it creates this devotion he becomes devoted to her because he sees inside her this character the kind of person that she is and it it, it appeals to him and he, he loves her for it and she does the same for him so when you come down to verse 10 of chapter 2 she says my beloved spake and said unto me rise up my love my fair one and come away for lo the winter is past the rain is over and gone the flowers appear on the earth the time of the singing of birds is come and the voice of the turtle which is the turtle dove uh, is heard in our land the fig tree putteth forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell arise my love my fair one and come away and so you have here the words of Solomon to her and he's calling for her to to come away with him so true love desires companionship he wants them to be together to share in one another's company and the language that is used here is of course describing the coldness of winter giving way to the warmth of spring and so you have the flowers beginning to bloom and the birds beginning to sing and the the trees are budding and it's a very beautiful time of year and it relates to their uh, budding and blooming feelings for one another their love that's growing for each other and so he wants her to to come away with him to be with them they can spend time together because true love desires that companionship now she returns that to him in chapter 3 and verse 1 she says by night on my bed I sought him whom my soul loveth I sought him but I found him not so she's dreaming about him and in her dream she's looking for him she says I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the broad ways I will seek him whom my soul loveth I sought him but I found him not the watchmen that go about the city found me to whom I said saw ye him whom my soul loveth it was but a little that I passed from them but I found him whom my soul loveth I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me and so here is Solomon wants her to go with him and now she wants Solomon to come with her and so in this dream she couldn't find him and she went looking all about the city for him asking the watchman if they had seen him and she finally found him and when she did she grabbed hold and she wasn't going to let go and she took him back to her parents house which is a sign of a purity that Solomon had maintained his purity as she had which we'll see a little later uh, that she was not afraid to bring him to her mother into her mother's house um, because of her of her love for him but this is the picture that's being painted they loved each other and you notice she calls him over and over the one that my soul loves and he calls her uh, my beloved and a dove and all of those things they genuinely loved one another and they desired companionship with one another to be in one another's company later on we're going to see that Solomon is king and that would present opportunities many of for uh, him to have to be away from his wife 
and that's one of the things that creates the trouble in their marriage. Uh, she missed him and, and having that companionship. It's so another thing that stands out in this book uh, about these two individuals and about their love is that they talk to each other a lot. Most of the book is her talking to Solomon and Solomon talking to her. They communicated with one another and kept those lines of communication open, and that's what enabled their love to continue. And so communication, of course, is clearly and obviously a part of, of love. And so this first section here gives us kind of a, a picture of this true love that they were beginning to have for one another and how it's growing, which is going to lead to, uh, to their marriage. So the second part of the book starts in verse 6 of chapter 3 and goes through the first verse of chapter 5. And it has to do with the marriage and the honeymoon. Uh, so we're not going to read a lot of this, but I'll just kind of point out a couple of things. At the end of chapter 3, verse 6 through 11, is um, the king's procession to um, come to, to claim his bride, to ask her to be his wife and to come home with him. And so it's a picture of the riches of Solomon, you know, and the, the pomp and the the, the material things that he had. So there's, you know, gold and there's soldiers and there's this whole procession and everything. But he's doing it all for her. He wants to impress her and convince her to come home with him to be his, his wife. So when you come to chapter 4 then, verses 1 through 7, um, you know, these are those verses that you can put on your Valentine card. Thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from the washing. That's how beautiful your, your teeth are, right? So he describes how beautiful um, she is. Again, it's demonstrating to her his affection for her and his desire to uh, marry her. And so then we come to verses 8 and 9, and you have uh, kind of the proposal here. He says, Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shinar and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. So from these mountains up in the north of Israel, you know, he says, look at the, at the land and then leave this and come with me. Come back to Jerusalem, meaning, of course, to be my bride. He says in verse 9, thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou, ha thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. And so his proposal is, will you marry me because, you know, I'm completely smitten by you. Head over heels, just one of your eyes has, you know, overwhelmed my, my heart. And so he was completely in love with her, and he wants her to, uh, to be his bride. It's interesting here that he calls her my sister, my spouse. In the early part of uh, this chapter, chapter 4, he uses words that um, describe a friend. So he calls her a friend, and he calls her a sister, and he calls her a spouse, which again shows the, the progression of the relationship and the many aspects of his feeling and his love for her, that spiritually she was a sister, they both loved God, and they wanted to serve him, and they had that in common. She was also a friend, which is obvious in how they talk to one another and relate to one another, enjoy each other's company and companionship, and now he wants her to be his spouse. So to take it you know, to the next level and to, to seal this relationship for the rest of their lives. And so again, it's more than just physical appearance. It's all these other things you know, that, that work together to build a lasting marriage, a lasting relationship. So he asks her, of course, you know, to, uh, to marry him. In verse 12, you notice he says, A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed, which has to do with her purity, her sexual purity, um, that she was a garden enclosed protected for for him he was to be her husband and so she had saved herself for for him and again the implication that we noticed earlier when she was not afraid to bring him into her mother's house 
was a statement of his purity. Um, sadly, Solomon is not going to maintain that standard of purity. Um, but again, this seems to be describing his, his first marriage. And what a beautiful thing it is when both the husband and the wife have saved themselves for one another and to enter into that relationship, into that marriage um, with that knowledge and that security and that trust and confidence in each other. So when you come down to the last verse there, verse 16, it says, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. So this is her reply to him. She's saying, yes, I will become your wife. And so I am for you, and, and I'm going to give myself uh, to you. And chapter 5 and verse 1 is um, the honeymoon. And he says, I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. And then he says, eat, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. And so um, the two become one, and the celebration is uh, the wedding celebration. The friends eat and drink because now they are joined together um, in, in marriage. And I think it's good to point out here, you know, that when God created man in the beginning, Genesis chapter 2 tells us that he said it is not good that man should be alone. I will create a help meet for him, a helper suitable for him. And of course, we have the story of the creation of woman. And when that story concludes, God says, therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined, shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, which is echoed several times um, in the New Testament. And so the picture that we have here is of a man and a woman who recognize that it's not good for them to be alone. They find love with one another and companionship and friendship and, and a spiritual connection. And it's more than just outward beauty. They're looking at the character of the other person and they become husband and wife. That's perfectly normal and natural and it's what God intended when he created man. And the physical side of that relationship that takes place in marriage is also perfectly normal and, and natural and, and something to be celebrated, which is what marriage is about. Uh, Hebrews 13 and verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. The American Standard Version says, Let marriage be had in honor among all, and let the bed be undefiled. And so it words it as, you know, this is something we are to do. But both of those statements are true. There's, there's nothing wrong with the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. God created it, you know, for that purpose. And that's the purpose of marriage, and it, it's nothing to be ashamed of. And this book is obviously acknowledging that. Sadly, we live in a world that has taken that relationship and separated it from marriage and made it, you know, the, the end and the goal of, you know, whatever you do in life. It's just about that. And so many have missed out on what God has truly created and designed, you know, for man and, and woman to be together. And so it's a good thing, I think, to go back and to read the Song of Solomon and to understand that this affection and this love and, and attraction and all of these different emotions we see between Solomon and his wife are not only you know normal, but there's a book in the Bible that says this is how it's supposed to be. And I, we need more you know thinking about that and teaching about that in preparing our young people for marriage and working on our own marriages to make them strong and, and what God wants them to be. So the marriage relationship is, is sacred and it's holy because it is ordained of God. And so it's never something that we should look down upon, and nor is it something that we should treat lightly and ignore God's rules and standards concerning. So that brings us to the last part of the book, chapter 5 and verse 2, down through the end of chapter 8, uh, verse 14. 
Uh, so what happens in verse 2 of chapter 5 through verse 2 of chapter 6 is that um, the, the bride has a, another dream. And in this dream, um, it's disturbing to her because she's separated from her husband um, and she can't find him. So in the dream, she hears him knocking at the door and he's asking her to open it. And, you know, in dreams, you, you do things crazy sometimes. And she says in verse 3, I put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I've washed my feet. How shall I defile them? I can't get up and open the door. I'm already in the bed. And so when she finally does go to open the door, he's not there anymore. He's gone. And so she feels like there's this separation between her and her husband. And maybe it's because Solomon is away with his duties of, of being king uh, or whatever, but it's manifesting in her dreams, and she's seeing this separation in their marriage, and it's, it's bothering her. And so she goes through you know, the rest of the dream. She describes her husband so people can help her uh, look for him. And then uh, at the end, in verse 3 of chapter 6, she comes to this conclusion. She says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. So she realizes that this was a dream, um, and, and so it's you know, not necessarily to be taken seriously, but what it's made her think about is a distance between her and her husband. She realizes, however, that he is hers and she is his, and they're true to one another, but that's something that needs to be held on to and needs to be maintained. And so she's going to learn from her dream to strengthen the ties that bind her and her husband. Okay, so in, in verse 4 of chapter 6 through verse 9 of chapter 7, it's another long passage where Solomon, the king, describes the beauty of, of his bride. So on the one hand, she feels there's this distance and she wants to bridge that gap and bring them back closer. He sees that and he helps to do that by reminding her of how he feels about her, of how beautiful she is and how much he desires her and how much he loves her. And so he goes overboard with the compliments here, um, describing you know, every little bit of her uh, and about how, how beautiful uh, she is to him. So in uh, verse 10 of chapter 7, we have the statement again, I am my beloved's and his desire is toward me. And so she understands that he still loves her and, and that they are now brought closer together than they were before. So whatever distance there was between them that was growing, they recognized that it was taking place and they communicated with one another and worked together to bring them back together. And now their relationship is stronger than it was before. And that's one of the, those other lessons about love. You know, that's how love works, that it can, it can always be made stronger. And even when we feel like it's becoming weaker or, you know, we're drifting apart, we can come back together. But we have to want to. We have to work at it. We have to put in the effort and the, uh, and the energy, you know, to do that. And that's what they did here. And so their, um, their relationship is, is strengthened. And so as a result, verse 11 says, she says, Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. And she goes on to talk about these places for uh, them to go and things for them to do, describing how she wants this continual companionship with her husband, that maybe they hadn't been spending as much time together, and that's where the, the trouble, the, the uneasy feeling was coming from. So he reminds her how beautiful she is and how much he loves her. And now she's reminding him how much she treasures him and desires his companionship. And so they're working together to, to bring those ties you know, that bind them back together and make their marriage even uh, stronger. And so that's through verse 4 of chapter 8. And then the last part of chapter 8 
gives us a, a final picture of true love in, in a marriage, especially. And also by doing so, you know, a picture of true love with God. So notice just quickly here in verse 6, there are three things that are stated. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. So the seal, of course, is um, like the ring, the signet, where you melt wax and you press the seal into it. So this seal is to be on the heart and, and on the arm. So in true love and in marriage, there is an, um, th this idea of belonging to one another. I am yours and you are mine. So I've put my seal on you, you put yours on me, and we're together. Okay, And then it says, uh, after that, for love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave and oftentimes we think of jealousy only in a in a bad way but here it's being stated to us in in a positive way that true love between a husband and wife is exclusive that she is your wife and you don't have that love for any other woman and he is your husband and you don't have that love for any other man that's how marriage is designed. It's exclusive, one man and one woman. And so jealousy is a part of that, not in a, in a bad way, in a negative way, but in the fact that you both acknowledge that we belong to each other. We have agreed to join ourselves together as husband and wife, forsaking all others till death do us part. Those are not just words, you know, it's a solemn vow that we make, and that's a picture of the love that's being described here. And then he says, uh, the coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. The American Standard Version says uh, the, the flashes, uh, flashes of fire, and then it says the very flame of Jehovah. So what this pictures for us is true love that is best shown in this um, relationship between uh, a man and his wife is a picture of the very flame of Jehovah that the flame of love that we feel toward another you know it flares up and we have uh, feelings toward toward another the source of that burning is God because God is love and he created us out of love and you know he gave his son for us out of love he saves us out of love. He allows us to live with him forever in heaven out of love. And so when we have love toward others, the root of that is, is coming from God, is the point. And again, this is love according to you know God's definition of love, not, not man's. And then real quick, and there are two things in verse 7. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. And so true love is unquenchable. This flame comes from God. No water can put it out. So they may have had obstacles and difficulties in their marriage, but if they put God first and if they put one another second and they both work at overcoming those obstacles, they will win. They'll have the victory because true love cannot be quenched. And then uh, if a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be contemned which means that true love is priceless. You can't put a price on it. Um, nothing that we may have or own or possess in this world is more valuable than love, than true love. Love for our spouse, love for our children, love for our parents, and of course, ultimately, our love for God. The Song of Solomon is to the Old Testament what 1 Corinthians 13 is to the New Testament. It is a picture God has given us of love, of its value, of its power, and, and to remind us of our need of it and how important and essential it is to our lives because it comes from him. God is love, and he wants us to learn what true love is so we can understand how much he loves us. That's why when we come to the New Testament in Ephesians 5, Paul describes the relationship between Christ and the church as the relationship between a husband and wife. 
because of this kind of love that Solomon has written about. And it's a beautiful book and a beautiful story to read and to think about this marriage uh, with Solomon and, and his first wife. It's sad to think about how far from that he's going to drift, but it's beautiful in its purity and, you know, just in, in the nature uh, of this affection that they have one for another. And so I hope that as we think about it, it will it cause us to think about it and to reflect upon what true love is, uh, to look at our relationships with our spouse, with our family, with our loved ones, and, you know, see if we are demonstrating true love, um, if we need to work on it and be stronger, you know, things like that, we can do what they did. But, but understanding that the importance and the necessity of that kind of love in our lives you know, is, is essential and what we need to learn from this. And ultimately, of course, the love of God, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He did all of that for us simply because he loved us. And we need to return that love to him by giving our lives to him. Just as Solomon gave himself to his bride, she gave herself to him. We pledge ourselves to the Lord and surrender our will to his. And by doing so, of course, we're obedient to his will. We become his children. We can live with him forever in heaven, all because of his amazing love for us. So I hope that it's been a blessing for us and it's benefited us to look briefly at, at the Song of Solomon. And I hope it's uh, maybe helped us in uh, you know, studying that book and seeing what it's all about. And maybe we'll encourage us you know, to read it uh, even more and to learn the great lessons uh, from it. But, uh, you know, it's one of those books. It's kind of difficult sometimes. But I'm glad we're able to study it and I hope that, uh, that we've been blessed by, by doing so. Uh, we're going to close our service. Uh, we'll have a closing prayer. I don't have any announcements or anything like that to make. And I, I couldn't get another song to come up here. I was going to play a clo closing song. But we'll just uh, we'll have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Uh, appreciate you being here and joining in with us online like this. And uh, everybody just stay safe uh, with the weather that's supposed to be coming and warm and, and safe. And uh, we'll get through it. But uh, appreciate so much you being here and being part of our service Let's bow for a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Our most holy and righteous Father in heaven, again, we're so thankful to you for this day, for the many blessings of it, and we're thankful that we've had this opportunity to study from thy word, and we're thankful for thy word and for even the Old Testament and the things that were written for our learning then, uh, and even this book that we've studied this evening, the Song of Solomon, that has pictured for us true love and demonstrated to us uh, just how much you truly love us. We're so thankful for that love, for your kindness and your grace toward us, for the gift of thy son. We pray that we will strive to learn even more about how to love you and to love you more and to demonstrate that love by our actions, in our character, and, and by being an example and a light to the world round about us. We thank you so much for Jesus, the demonstration of your love, for the hope that we have through him, the forgiveness of our sins. We pray that you'll watch over us and bless us and keep us safe uh, through the weather that is coming our way. We pray that we'll have safety and uh, that no harm will come to us. We pray that you'll watch over us and bless us with opportunities to serve thee throughout the coming days and that we'll always seek to do thy will. Again, we're so thankful for Christ, for the hope that we have in him, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you again for uh, joining in. and. Uh, Hopefully we'll be back together on, uh, on Wednesday. Appreciate you being here, and we'll close out for now.